So, uh, my name's Liz Rice. I am Chief Open Source Officer at Isovalent. Isovalent is the company that originated Cilium, although you know, it's become a project that's bigger than just one company. And uh, today, we're going to hear from Thomas, who was one of the founders of the project and had the initial vision for Cilium. We're going to hear from Laurent from Datadog about how they're using Cilium. We're going to hear from Purvi from Google about how they've been adopting Cilium in the data plane. And, and then I'm going to wrap up with a little bit about how you can all get involved in Cilium. Can I get a show of hands? How many of you are currently using Cilium today? Good number, excellent. How many of you are thinking about using Cilium? Okay. How many of you have contributed PRs to Cilium? A few of you. How many of you would like to contribute PRs to Cilium? Nice. Excellent. Wonderful. Uh, have I failed to ask any questions? I think that's, uh, yeah, that's great. So, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Thomas, who is going to explain a little bit about what Cilium is. So, welcome, Thomas. Thank you very much, Liz. All right, welcome, and hello, my name is Thomas Graf. As Liz mentioned, I was one of the creators of Cilium. I also co-founded Isovalent, the company behind Cilium. Because this is the first time for many of you uh, that you hear about Cilium, I want to do a quick introduction, very briefly, on what is Cilium and what is eBPF, because both are tightly connected together. So what is Cilium? Cilium is a CNCF project at incubation stage. It uses eBPF, and we'll talk about what eBPF is, to provide networking, security, observability, very new service mesh, and ingress. As mentioned, it's in the Cloud Native Foundation, and as underlying technology, it uses eBPF and Envoy, and we'll see where Envoy gets into the picture. Cilium today is used by many, many users from all sorts of verticals, SaaS companies, we'll hear uh, an end user uh, with Lorna later on, but also telcos, cloud providers, for example, GKE and Puri, we will talk about this, is using Cilium as the networking layer for managed Kubernetes offering. So what is eBPF? How many of you have, a, uh, have heard about eBPF before? Everybody, great, All right, thank you. <laughs> eBPF is in one sentence, to the kernel, what JavaScript is to the browser. What I mean by that is eBPF makes the Linux kernel programmable, which means we can extend, we can change the behavior of the Linux kernel by loading eBPF programs. And very similar to JavaScript, they run in a safe sandbox environment. The difference is they run a lot faster than a JavaScript program. We can do this for a variety of events. In the slide, we're seeing an example where this is done for a system call. We can do this for network packets, for storage access, for file access, for um, a variety of trace points, K probes, U probes. Um, Cilium uses, obviously, networking-related uh, endpoints. Cilium is not just a CNI, though, because many of you have probably heard about Cilium as a CNI first, which provides very scalable, and we'll hear about scale from Laura, secure and high-performance CI networking for Kubernetes. Cilium is also a service mesh now. So Cilium can provide a sidecar-free service mesh and ingress. We have network observability with Project Hubble, which provides open telemetry, Prometheus metrics, and very new, recently announced, Tetragon providing security observability and runtime enforcement. So let's look into all of them a little bit. Cilium CNI, what are all the things it can do? There's a lot. Obviously, it's a CNI, and it provides a variety of networking functions. So for the, for the networking people in here, IPv4, IPv6, of course, but then also things like Net Net4.6, translating IPv4, IPv6, so we can um, bootstrap an IPv6-only cluster but still make pods addressable by, by IPv4. But, for example, for telcos, also provides SRV6, so a very wide range of networking capabilities. 
it supports various topologies, overlays, PGPs, and integration into all cloud provider SDNs, at least all major cloud providers. It can replace QProxy, so it can provide Kubernetes service implementation, and it has its own north-south load balancers, so load balancing traffic into the cluster. And very new, Kubernetes Ingress, layer seven, traffic management load balancing. Cilium has extensive network security controls, obviously support for Kubernetes network policies, but they can then be extended with Cilium network policies to provide, for example, DNS-based policies, so a policy where you can use DNS names or wildcards to define what is allowed, and also layer seven, HTTP, Kafka, and so on, where you can, where you can provide even better security policies. On top of segmentation, we can also do transparent encryption with IPsec and WireGuard. Widely popular is also the multi-cluster and external workload, so we can connect clusters together with Cilium using standard Kubernetes resources. So we don't need to use additional CRDs or anything. You can use Kubernetes services to define, for example, global services and do service discovery across multiple clusters. Of course, network policies will work as well. Fascinating as well is the egress gateway and external workloads because often not everything can be moved into your Kubernetes cluster. Egress gateways allow you to represent PAW traffic behind stable source IPs, which make the life of traditional network firewalls a lot easier because all they understand are IP addresses. And Cilium can also run on virtual machines and metal machines, so you can integrate external machines that you don't want to run uh, as part of containerized workloads and integrate from a network perspective, integrate them into your um, Kubernetes. Hubble, in a nutshell, provides uh, metrics, logs, and a service map, layer three, layer four on the network level, but also layer seven. We're seeing an example how Hubble um, is parsing HTTP requests and provides, for example, HTTP latency to build a golden signal dashboard. We also have a service map where you can see what services are talking to each other, and then you can export all of these metrics and these logs via Prometheus, FluentD, just as JSON, you can build Grafana dashboards, Elasticsearch, and what we've added recently, open telemetry support as well. Cilium Service Mesh is moving to stable in 1.12. That was, uh, will be released in a couple of weeks, which adds a native Service Mesh capability. Cilium Service Mesh offers two options to implement Service Mesh. The option we had so far was option number two, where Cilium integrates with Istio and enforces its layer seven policies in the sidecars of, what, of, the, of, the, side, of the sidecars managed by Istio. The new option is a completely sidecar-free service mesh where eVPF and Envoy together provide a service mesh data path that does not require to run sidecars in each pod. What's important to us is we want to support the entire ecosystem of service mesh control planes. So whether you want to use Istio or Linkerd or SMI or maybe just Kubernetes Ingress or a gateway API to define what you want to do with the service mesh, we want to support all of that. And obviously for the observability that we can provide, support the ecosystem in the cloud native space. Tetragon um, introduced this week was part of our enterprise offering so far, and this week we have open sourced Tetragon, and with this it has moved into the cloud native foundation. It is the ability to provide runtime visibility, so for example, ability to see what system calls are being made, what files are being accessed. We can see privilege escalation, so when a pod gains security privileges, we can see when a pod breaks out of a container namespace. And then even more importantly, we can actually mitigate some of that. So when we see these events happen, we have an in-kernel eBPF implementation to react to that and automatically terminate a process that violates the rules. For the observability, uh, of course, the usual ecosystem that we can uh, provide. So you can, with the runtime visibility we have, build Grafana dashboards, export that into your SIM via FluentD, for example, or use um, um, a open telemetry collector to provide syscall traces, for example. Last but not least, very briefly on like what's coming in 1.13. So we're about to release 1.12. So we're in feature freeze for 1.12, which will move service mesh out of beta into stable. In 1.13, we will uh, focus heavily on adding additional service mesh control plane integrations 
Gateway API support will be coming. Spiffy integration, the PR is out there. We want to merge that in time for 113, as well as a new architecture for providing mutual authentication with MTLS that will work not only for TCP, but for all variety of network traffic. Obviously, a lot more. But these are the high-level points. But even more importantly, what is missing? Tell us. And Liz will be speaking a bit. Oops. Liz will be speaking a bit more about how you can actually influence the roadmap, how you can tell us uh, what we should be doing next. And with that, I would like to introduce Laura from Datadoc, talking about Datadoc's journey with Cilium. with a live audience for, a first time, for the first time in a long while. Um, I'm, I'm Laurent Bernay. I work at Datadog. Um, I'm staff engineer there, and I work in infrastructure. OK. Oh, sorry. There's a bit of a delay. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> that's long, maybe. Oh, that's going to work. OK. Um, so for those of you who don't know Datadog, we're an observability company. I put a few figures on the left-hand side of the slides, but I'm not going to go through them because they don't really matter for what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I, I work uh, in the infrastructure team of Datadog, and this is where we, we use Cilium and, and why I'm here today. So just to give you an idea of the challenges we have is, well, we, we currently run tens of thousands of nodes and hundreds of thousands of pods. And, and the challenge is we have a lot of Kubernetes clusters because, of course, we can't run clusters that big. But they're already pretty big, as you can see, because our biggest clusters are uh, close to, I mean, this slide says 4,000 nodes, but we now have clusters close to five to 6,000 nodes. To make things even more complex, we run on multiple cloud providers, and we're growing pretty fast. So this is a very high-level view of uh, our, our infra. So we run on different cloud providers with different constraints. And, and of course, what we want is we want communications to be secure within clusters, but also between clusters, right? Because we have so many, so many, so many clusters, we also have a lot of communication between clusters, and we need ways to, to, to make this configure, these communications secure. So one of the things, uh, one of the constraints that comes with our design is because we have workloads running in multiple clusters, we want to be able to efficiently route traffic between workloads, right? For instance, imagine you have a Kafka cluster running in one Kubernetes cluster, and you have Kafka clients in another cluster. You want this communication to work. And for this to work, you can't use load balancers. You can use ingress at least easily. So you need all the pods to have IPs that are routable within your network, right? And so this is a design choice we made very, very early on because it's more performant because we don't have an overlay, and it allows for communication between clusters. Of course, it's not as easy. There's a reason many people start with overlay, because overlays are very simple to set up. All your clusters are independent. You don't have issues uh, managing the IP space. But if all your IPs are rotable, then you need to be very careful how you allocate IP. And, and siding clusters is, is a bit challenging. Siding subnets is challenging. And of course, even if you have IPs that are rotable between clusters, uh, it's not because IP communication works that services can discover themselves, right? So we need a solution to discover services between clusters. The, the solution we started with, and to be honest, we were very happy with it for, for a long time, was to use one of the first plugins that was providing writable IPs for pods in AWS, which was a plugin developed by Lyft. And of course, on other cloud providers, uh, this wasn't working because it was uh, AWS specific. And on GCP, we were lucky because GCP was already providing IP alias ranges, which is also heavily used in GKE. And this, these two solutions were, were working for AWS and GCP, but they were different. And we had no solution for other providers. In addition to that, uh, we're starting to see issues uh, when the scale was increasing uh, with, with the Lyft CNI plugin because IP allocation was done on each single on each node, which means when you have thousands of nodes uh, asking for allocation, well, you have issues with API rate limits, for instance. And and with this solution, we had we had no uh, network policy, and and no support for encryption between nodes. Another challenge we had was service load balancing. Uh, so I'm sure most of you are familiar with how this usually works. Uh, 
you have kubeproxy that is responsible for transforming services into pod IPs. And of course, I mean, we did like everyone, we started with IP tables uh, at the beginning, but uh, if, you, if you run uh, kubeproxy in IP tables mode on large clusters, I'm sure you've seen, you've seen some interesting challenges such as the size of the, uh, and the number of IP table rules, the time it takes to update them, the time it takes to match them. And so we decided early on to, to, to use IPVS instead of IP tables. That was much better, but it was very new. And it didn't have all the features uh, IP tables had, so it was not honoring everything Kubernetes was supporting. And connection tracking in IPVS proved to be very, very difficult for us. And as a summary, I mean, we, we had many, many growing pains. Uh, in, for service, uh, service load balancing, uh, IPVS and IP tables kind of worked, both with issues, but they were really not designed to do smart client-based load balancing, like client-side load balancing. And it's obvious for IP tables. I mean, IP tables was not designed for load balancing. And while IPVS was designed for load balancing, it was designed for middle boxes, not for client-side load balancing. Also, um, getting patches in the kernel and improvement was pretty slow. And something that happened pretty recently is we, had the bug, we found a bug in the kernel in the VS code, uh, which impacted performance. And getting this, it was actually easy to get it fixed. But of course, then you need, you need this to, to roll out, right? And I mentioned network policy before. Doing network policy with IP table was possible. But of course, once again, it's a lot of IP table rules. So this gets us to why we're currently using Cilium, right? Because what it gives us is the power of eBPF, where we can uh, program the features we need. And of course, all the features are provided by Cilium, but I was mentioning before the VS bug, uh, when we discovered the bug, I, I reported to Cilium because at the very beginning, I was assuming it was due to the configuration, uh, through our Cilium configuration, but it turned out to be a, a kernel bug down the road. And, and Daniel from the Cilium team was like, oh, it's going to be very easy. What we're going to do is gonna, we're going to fix this in the data pass of Cilium in eBPF, and you're not going to see the bug anymore. So that was, that was amazing. Something I wanted to mention is we started as users of Cilium, of course. Uh, but we have uh, we run it at um, quite so, quite some scale, and we have a few specific use cases based on our uh, on our design things at, at Datadog. And so we, after some time, uh, we started suggesting uh, features, and then we started contributing uh, contributing some some small fixes and some larger ones. And what I wanted to mention is we really felt welcome. Uh, Cilium maintainers are very welcoming. So I, before many of you raised your hand when uh, Liz asked who, was, who wanted to, to contribute to Cilium, I can tell you it's, it's pretty easy to get started because people are very, very welcoming. So in terms of contribution, we, we did a few. I wanted to mention uh, two, two recent ones that might be of interest for some of you. Um, one is prefix delegation on AWS. So we run Cilium in IPAM mode where uh, Cilium is allocating um, IPs to AWS uh, inter interfaces. And the problem is when your VPC starts to get big and you allocate IPs one by one, uh, you start having issues with, with the VPC because it can get slower. And AWS heavily recommended we migrate to this uh, new design from AWS, which is called prefix delegation, where instead of allocating IPs to interfaces one by one, you can allocate a block of IPs. And so this was possible on AWS, but it was not supported yet by Cilium, and so uh, someone from the team, Heyman from the team, did, did all the work to, to support that, and I think it's going to be in 112, if I'm correct. Uh, another one that's, uh, that's recent is uh, we had interesting issues where when you delete a pod, uh, suddenly the IP is not readable anymore, and it's just black holes. And it's sometimes very interesting to notify the client that this IP is not readable by sending an, an ICMP error, so you don't get into a scene retry loop. And so this is a new feature we, we added. Um, and another, another one is, uh, I didn't put it in the slide because I forgot, is we landed uh, a, an interesting performance improvement where instead of having, adding IPs one by one when uh, we noted that, there is, um, that the node doesn't have IPs available for pods anymore, uh, we can now watch for all the pending pods for a node, which means instead of allocating them one by one, we can allocate blocks of IPs and it's, and it's much faster. So yeah, I mean, we, we've been using Cilium for, for, some time now, for some time now, and we really plan to continue and, and to use it and to, and to contribute to it, because it's been, yeah, it's been um, a very interesting journey for us. 
And on this, I'm going to welcome Pruvi. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, Lauren. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Purvi Desai, Director of Engineering, Kubernetes Networking, Google Cloud. Uh, I'm very happy to be here to give you an update on uh, GK Data Plane V2 and our journey forward with Cilium. So we launched the GK Data Plane version 2 in, uh, based on eBPF Cilium uh, in 2020. And from very early on, uh, we saw the eBPF and Cilium's disruptive innovation in enabling the, or exposing the programmability in the stack, network stack of Linux. So based on Cilium, GK Data Plane V2 is our opinionated and fully managed and Kubernetes compliant network stack. So you all know we have been fully committed to Kubernetes community and uh, Kubernetes open source. And with this, we were and committed to Cilium community and Cilium open source. As, as uh, many of us know that one of the hidden superpower of Kubernetes is really the developer-first networking model. And with DataPlane V2, what we did was we harnessed the power of eBPF, Cilium, and the Kubernetes. And this is very important for us, and we have seen great feedback from the customers. Uh, but more importantly, we are very happy and very proud that Google was the first cloud provider to adopt Cilium. And the strategy has uh, worked out very well based on the customer feedback that we have received. Uh, since the launch, we have uh, enabled it as a general, uh, we have generally uh, GA'd it as a data plane foundation for our flagship GKE, Anthos, and newly announced uh, platforms like Google Distributed Cloud Edge and Google Distributed Cloud Hosted. And this is also now a default for our innovative offering of GKE Autopilot. So why we have always been excited, but we have also seen our users um, really interesting in migrating away from IP tables and towards this uh, ability to harness the flexibility uh, of the stack. Now, um, during this journey, we have actually learned a lot from our customers. And uh, while listening to them, um, we feel the power of end and not or. Uh, our customers, while they love the fully managed service and opinionated uh, service, we also have customers who would like to have the flexibility and an ability to pick and choose the best of both worlds, which is Cilium and the, uh, Google's opinionated service. So we believe we can make this happen uh, by bringing, we can achieve this by bringing the modularity, pluggability, and composability in, data, in Cilium and in data plane with. So we'll be investing in this uh, coming, in the coming months and then journey forward. So um, the North Star for GKE is a vibrant and open ecosystem where we can offer uh, innovative networking features. We are very excited with uh, what lies ahead in the journey and we plan to uh, give you all a tangible and detailed update in upcoming KubeCon North America in October. So uh, stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to Pervy and thank you to Laurent for sharing their experiences of working with Cilium. And we really appreciate the input from our adopters from our users and their contributions and their feedback. So at the start, quite a few of you said you're interested in using Cilium, but you've not tried it out yet. So here are a few pointers for where you can go to, to get started. Now, Cilium.io is the website. There's a page on there with a collection of uh, pointers to beginner materials, whether that's the documentation, whether it's our weekly introduction sessions with Thomas and other um, 
contributors and maintainers from, from the Cilium project who will answer your questions and help point you in the right direction if you have some initial uh, questions. We have documentation with a number of getting started guides and we now have some interactive tutorials that will show you some of the basics. If you're new to the project, I really highly recommend joining the Slack channel because that's really the, the, the easiest way to reach out to the community to ask for help, to get help, and to give feedback to the maintainers. Maybe it's going to work, maybe it's not. <laughs> maybe I'll use the button. Okay, so if you do ask for assistance on Slack. You'll find uh, a number of channels related to some subtopics. I mean, obviously, people have a tendency to just put everything in general and, and then things get lost. So um, if you do realize that your question is very specific to Service Mesh or Hubble or some other feature of Cilium, then it's great if you can use those specific channels. I also really recommend you to help answer questions in those Slack channels because after all, this is a community project and your experiences as uh, an existing user are really valuable. You know, this has to be a community uh, where we can help each other solve problems. Sometimes you will find something that is you know, not just a question but actually needs a, a change or a fix. And of course, GitHub is the place to raise issues. Um, I've just listed Cilium, the organization, because we do have the, the main Cilium, Cilium repo, and also some other sub repos for things like Tetragon and Hubble. And uh, you, you'll probably find it pretty obvious, if in doubt, use Cilium, Cilium. So feature ideas, as you've heard from our users, you know, we often find that there is uh, a new, a new requirement, some interface that someone wants to uh, integrate with um, an issue. Pro I would strongly recommend asking questions and asking for feedback about ideas on Slack. Partly that helps to uh, see if there's a community of other people who want the same feature or um, have the same idea. We have a new uh, a CFP template. If you go to the issues uh, part of GitHub and you raise a feature request, you can fill that in at a high level. Or if you have a, like, a strong opinion on how it could be implemented or you want to provide a lot of details, there's a Google Doc template that you can use to sort of give us a bit more expansive idea on, on what it is that you'd like to achieve. And for a bigger feature, we use those CFP templates as a, a kind of way of asynchronously debating how larger features could be implemented. Um, if you want to see the, the roadmap, now there's no real replacement for GitHub issues. GitHub issues is the set of things that we know about that we would like to implement. Um, the kind of higher level set of broader features that we want to tackle, we've started publishing in a community roadmap. We deliberately don't put timeframes on those because it's a community project. So if, you, if there's something specific that you really want, uh, you can help contribute to that feature, or you can at least give us the feedback on why it's urgent and uh, what you could possibly do to help us bring uh, items in in the time frame that you need them. And if you are one of those people who put your hand up because you would like to make contributions to the code, there's a whole developer section in the Cilium docs that will tell you how to set up the build environment. They'll tell you about the uh, kind of, uh, uh, what do you call it? The, um, ah, I've lost the word, but, you know, making code consistent. Um, so just guidelines for how you can develop. I strongly recommend getting involved in Slack and talking about a PR before you submit it, because quite often there might be you know, half a dozen different ways to tackle a problem, and 
there may be some strong opinions from the maintainers about which of those approaches is the best. So we'd much rather have that discussion first, help point you in the right direction, and uh, make it an easy process for getting those PRs accepted and merged, because that's what we all want. We, nobody wants PRs sitting there unmerged. We have a number of issues. I think I looked this morning, and there were 90-something issues labeled with good first issue. So I think there were probably about 90 of you who put your hand up and said you wanted to contribute. If everybody takes one, great. <laughs> and of course, you might want to actually talk to people. I know it's, you know it's been amazing actually seeing people in real life this week. Um, we might all be a bit fed up of Zoom calls, but it can be really useful to have a conversation. So we have a weekly developer call. You'll find all the details on GitHub and, and also in the, the documentation. Uh, you can add items to the agenda. There's a, 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 a sort of ongoing living Google Doc that describes what the agenda is every week. We welcome you to come in and add the items that you want to discuss. We also have some special interest groups that you know, may be very busy one week and, and less busy another time, depending on what's happening in different areas of the project. Um, so if you have specific areas of focus, you might want to join a, a SIG or... Um, but I would, I would say join the developer call first and, and get advice on who is involved in particular areas of the project. And last but very much not least, you might want to be making contributions to the project in other ways. We really want to enable people to go out and help their local communities learn about Cilium, get help from Cilium. So if you have stories to tell, whether you want us to amplify your blog posts, maybe put a blog post on the Cilium site. Um, if you want slides, perhaps you want to present something about Cilium in your local meetup, we can support you with some slides. We have a, a, a form that you can fill in if you'd like to, us to send swag. Um, and also, if you want to ask one of the maintainers from Cilium, if you'd like to invite them to speak at an event, you know, I'm not going to guarantee that you'll always get a yes, but we can try and connect you with people in your local area who might be interested in having a discussion and uh, sharing the Cilium joy locally. So that Get Help page will give you a form. You can ask for all kinds of help. We also really want your ideas on how you might want to contribute to Cilium. So yeah, get in touch on Slack. That is the best way to reach all of us, the best way to tell us what you need, your ideas for Cilium going forward. I think we have about three minutes for questions. So uh, questions for Thomas, for Laurent, or, and Purvi. Would you like to come on in case we can? If you can shout out a question, I will try and repeat it for the mic if you have questions. Any questions? There's a whole room of them. Must be a question. Yeah. Yes, wonderful. The purpose of, so first of all, the North Star, as I mentioned, is about that vibrant and the open ecosystem to enable the innovation of the networking features. The main purpose is, as we said, we are hearing our customers where they would like to be, like, they would like to have things from open source, the goodness from here, and then also get the managed and the differentiation from Google Cloud, let's say, on GKE. So for us, it is important to have that kind of ecosystem where they can run some tools, where they get, get from Cilium and uh, make it work. And maybe even, actually, if everything works out well, far away in the future, maybe they can even write ABPF programs and install it. But that's like a vision, vision. OK. There's another one, Justin. Yeah. Yes, so question, well, just to repeat the question, question was, great eBPF, but what are the limitations? So the answer is, what's specific about eBPF is that it can run in the Linux kernel. That was it, that's what's different to other languages, such as WebAssembly or Java or just C. 
this privilege to run in the Linux kernel comes with limitations because nobody wants their kernel to crash, which means in order for a BPF program to be loadable, it needs to be verifiable. This means it needs to be verified by the kernel verifier and it will be rejected if it does not pass this check. One of the conditions is, for example, complexity. We cannot run a 10 megabyte word processing app into the kernel. Um, programs need to terminate. They need to be able to run to completion, which means it needs to be known that they will eventually end. So it doesn't run continuously and your kernel will just stall. Um, and there's also a size limit um, to the program. So we can only load a program that is, uh, is, that is so much or so, so big. So there are limitations. These limitations exist, so it is safe to run um, programs in the kernel. But if we look at the feature set of Cilium, I would say that the limitations are not holding back much. And some of those limitations have, have been reduced in the sense of like the number of instructions that you can run an eBPF program has increased over time, so it's less and less of a problem. I think we are pretty much out of time. We'll probably get kicked out of the room. I'm just going to add one more point. Well, first of all, two more points. One is there is a Cillium booth. Do come and ask your questions. Um, there are people manning that booth for the rest of today and tomorrow, so we'd love to have a chat with you there. Uh, and also, if you're interested in eBPF, we have some books that apparently have actually arrived after being stuck in customs. So at half past four today, uh, we'll have those on the isovalent booth if you're interested in one of those. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming here.